Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless proverbs 29 2 when the righteous are in authority the people rejoice but when a wicked man rules the people groan when President Biden took office, he said, America is back, baby. And he said he would assert this very- The norms. Um, like, what happened this to very the norms? mature foreign policy. We have had nothing but disaster globally. The world is on fire. There are, we had a stable situation in the Middle East. He decided to prioritize Palestinian interests to help Iran become a dominant, uh, become dominant again in the region. And we see how that's going. You have the Ukraine war, which has devolved into a stalemate. You have China continuing to rise. What's wild here is that Biden really is doing his best, I think, to put a good face on something that really isn't resonating. Watch. I truly believe this country is about to take off because for the first time in a long time, we're bringing pride back to cities and towns all across America and left behind. I can honestly say I've never been more optimistic about America's future. Seventy-six percent of Americans saying America is going in the wrong direction. We begin tonight with those words from President Biden behind closed doors, but they made immediate news. The president warning the risk of nuclear Armageddon has not been this high since the Cuban Missile Crisis amid the threats from Vladimir Putin. The president saying Putin is not joking. President Biden saying the threat of the use of nuclear weapons has not been this high since Kennedy and Cuba. The Pentagon asking Congress to find a nuclear bomb 24 times more powerful than those dropped on Japan to end World War II. This would be major to have in our arsenal. This is the Senate Armed Services Committee raises concerns about growing nuclear threats from Russia, North Korea. Military leaders in the United States want to see Congress approve the production of a brand new nuclear weapon far more powerful than the atom bombs used in World War II. The military leaders saying they want to keep Americans protected from rising threats around the world. As the world watches wars being fought in both Europe and the Middle East, this morning a new push by the Department of Defense to upgrade its nuclear weapons. Military leaders recently announcing they will pursue production of the B-6113 nuclear gravity bomb, a weapon 24 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan during World War II. One defense leader writing in a statement that the need for the new nuclear weapon, quote, is reflective of a changing security environment and growing threats from potential adversaries. This is as serious a topic as we will hear about this year. Earlier this month on Capitol Hill, the Senate Armed Services Committee focused on the country's nuclear strategy. Leaders from both sides noted ongoing threats from enemies like Russia, which recently de-ratified a nuclear test ban treaty, as well as North Korea, which continues to conduct numerous weapons tests. To prevent war and keep the peace, it is incumbent on legislators to commit today to a program of sustained innovation and investment. This is the only way we can reclaim lost ground. This mission has become more urgent through Russia's assault on Ukraine and because of China's rapid strategic expansion. Here in the U.S., just two weeks ago, the National Nuclear Security Administration announced a team conducted an underground chemical explosion at a test site in Nevada, aimed at improving America's ability to detect nuclear explosions around the world. Now, with a call to upgrade the U.S.'s own weapons, some lawmakers want to see the country be prepared. It is time to begin making the national defense investments required to deter the conflicts looming ahead. The Department of Defense adds that this new nuclear weapon will give the president the option against uh, certain harder and large area enemy targets while also uh, discouraging enemies from possibly targeting the United States. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John was banished to the island of Patmos as punishment for sharing his faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord gave John a series of visions which described things that would take place in the last days. The visions John saw were recorded, 
and are now known as the Book of Revelation. In his book, There's a New World Coming, published in 1973, Hal Lindsey writes, Although it is possible for God to supernaturally pull off every miracle in the book of Revelation and use totally unheard of means to do it, I personally believe that all the enormous ecological catastrophes described in this chapter, Revelation 8, are the direct result of nuclear weapons. In actuality, man inflicts these judgments on himself. God simply steps back and removes his restraining influence from man, allowing him to do what comes naturally out of his sinful nature. In fact, if the book of Revelation had never been written, we might well predict these very catastrophes within 50 years or less. Hal Lindsey wrote that book 50 years ago and is spot on with what is taking place in our world today. Throughout the scriptures, terrible times are forecast for the end of this present age. The prophet Isaiah describes the earth as empty and wasted. Isaiah 24.1 Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. In the book of Revelation, we read of an hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The Lord Jesus warns us of great tribulation which shall threaten the survival of all life on earth. Matthew 24, 21 and 22 But then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The Apostle Paul speaks of sudden destruction that shall come just when men are saying, Peace and safety. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. As these verses indicate, along with current events, make it plain that world conditions will be characterized by chaos, destruction, and death, just before our Lord returns to take control of planet Earth. In the book of Revelation, we read about the poisoning of the oceans, the burning up of the grass and the trees, and the sun scorching people with great heat. The book of Revelation also tells us that horrible plagues will afflict mankind. There will be widespread wars and famines, and that the atmosphere will become so polluted as to reduce visibility by one-third. In the midst of all this devastation, the Earth's population will flee to the caves as people cry to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. What could possibly bring about such universal carnage on the Earth? Is the Bible describing a nuclear holocaust, nuclear weapons, appear to be specified in Zechariah 14.12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. The book of Joel gives us detailed imagery that describes something so huge that it seems to encompass the earth and the sky is made up of fire and pillars of smoke and is so vast that it darkens the sun and reddens the moon. Joel 2, 30 and 31 And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. As we reported, Democrats want Biden to drop Bidenomics and run as a wartime president even though White House officials are panicked that we're bumbling into World War III, which is exactly what Biden said Trump would do. A president who says he wants to end endless wars in the Middle East is bringing us dangerously close to starting a brand new one. Funny how that works. Also funny, Biden used to be the champion of nuclear arms control, and now the big guy has a huge nuke he wants to show off.
The president announced a new nuclear bomb 24 times more powerful than what we used against the Japanese in Hiroshima. And thank God we used it because going island to island against the Japanese military, who would have never surrendered, would have cost millions of American lives. But then America and the Soviet Union entered into an insane nuclear arms race, spending billions of dollars building enough warheads to destroy the Earth's population a thousand times. But the Soviets lost the arms race, thanks to Reagan. And we've been dialing back our nuke arsenal until now. The Biden bomb looks hellacious. And the president wants to show it to our enemies. Yeah, last month, the Biden administration invited China and Russia to watch us test our new nuke in Nevada. Why is Joe Biden inviting our enemy scientists into our most sensitive nuclear weapons facility? Joining me now to explain the raw power behind this new bomb, theoretical physicist Dr. Michio Kaku. How big is the Biden bomb? Well, it's a tactical nuclear weapon, not a hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bombs are a whole other category. But this bomb is 24 times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. It'd be enough to flatten, for example, most of uh, New York metropolitan area if it were to be dropped right here. So we're talking about a, a pretty big punch in a tactical war. And then the question is what Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. <laughs> if he allows us to come into our most nuclear uh, uh, secret facility, we should have the right to reciprocate and look at their arsenal. But he's not asking for that. <laughs> I have a feeling that's not going to happen. Do you get nervous when you think of the idea of Chinese nuclear science that's kind of peeling around uh, Los Alamos? Yeah, because, of course, these are our crown jewels. Uh, this is the culmination of decades' work uh, worth, work, uh, in terms of nuclear bombs. And we're just going to give it away. So <laughs> that's what Reagan said, reciprocate. Okay. We have to have the right to go to their facilities to see what kind of weapons they're working on rather than being suckers and just letting them into our facilities. Why do we have a bomb this big? Well, in a tactical situation, you want bombs that are flexible, powerful, pack a punch at a very specific point. You don't want the bomb to go crazy. You want reliability. You want accuracy. And the bomb is called the B-6113. And this bomb is better than the B-61-7, which was not as accurate, didn't have as many safety protocols. Because when the war starts, you want the bomb to work. You want the <laughs> bomb to land where it's supposed to land, not go off course. Are any of you suffering from end times fatigue? Are world events weighing heavily on your mind? Are the everyday wars and rumors of wars, government uprisings, violence, wickedness, and extreme weather events making you long for Jesus' return? If you said yes to these questions, you are not alone. I want to encourage those of you who are growing weary. As much as we want Jesus to return, God has a perfect plan. God wants as many people to be saved as possible, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 8, and 9. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are five responses we should have concerning Bible prophecy in the end times. The first is obedience. Jesus said this in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Christians need to be living holy lives, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The second response is worship. Our worship on earth will one day become worship in heaven, as we read in Revelation 5, 8 through 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. The third response is proclamation. The message of God's salvation and the truth of the rapture and Christ's second coming 
need to be proclaimed for all to hear, especially to those who don't yet believe. Romans 10.17 So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We must give everyone the chance to turn to God and be saved from his coming wrath. The fourth response is service. All believers should be diligent about carrying out God's will and performing good works. Part of Christ's judgments will be of the works performed by believers. Those works do not determine a Christian's acceptance into heaven, but they do show what each follower of Jesus did with the gifts given to a believer by God. The Apostle Paul says this concerning this coming judgment, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 The fifth response is fellowship, as we read in Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The last response to God's prophetic word is watching and praying, as we read in Luke 21.36. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus continually tells us to be ready for his coming, which could happen at any time, as we read in Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. While watching, Luke tells us how Christians are to be living their lives, as we read in Luke 21, 34, and 35. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. There is coming a time when we will no longer grow tired of the end times, as we read in Isaiah 40, 28-30. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God will remove every tear from our eyes, and there will be no more pain, as we read in Revelation 21.4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Tonight, with tensions at the Israel-Lebanon border reaching fresh highs, Hezbollah's second-in-command, Naeem Qasim, in an American TV exclusive, providing a rare glimpse into the militant group's strategy. So, right now, Hezbollah is simply trying to distract the Israelis from their military action in Gaza. That's your main goal? Of course, Hezbollah participates for the sake of lowering the pressure on Gaza and for the sake of preventing Israel from achieving its objectives. In addition, as a clear message that if you expand it, there will be serious consequences. These messages have been delivered and are still being delivered. But distracting Israel is far from Hezbollah's only goal. 
The group's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, vowing to kill one Israeli civilian for every Lebanese civilian casualty. A threat taking on new urgency after an Israeli airstrike killed a woman and three children in Lebanon on Sunday, according to state media. Israel says Hezbollah has already fired 30 rocket strikes in retaliation. Are you going to expand your attacks? Are you going to deliberately target Israeli civilians? We normally don't discuss our operational activities and how we will behave. What we will do, you will see in the press, God willing. But Hassan Nasrallah did discuss his plans. Hassan Nasrallah did say one Lebanese civilian for one Israeli civilian. That sounds like a plan. That sounds like a plan to kill Israeli civilians. You can start counting and you will see whether or not our calculations are correct or not. Israel says it's now leading what it calls a global battle against Iranian-backed groups, including Hamas and Hezbollah. What we see is a broader battle between civilization and barbarism. The barbarism is led by an axis of terror. But what Netanyahu calls the axis of terror, Iran and its allies in the region call an axis of resistance. And lately, the axis of resistance has been more active than ever, striking American military and Israeli targets across the Middle East. Can you tell the other members of the axis of resistance to stop harassing the Israelis and the Americans? It's a question directed at America and Israel. It's upon them to stop the aggression so that things do not expand. And if they do, only God knows how much it might expand. Well, Tom, you saw Naeem Qasim's reaction to my question about deliberately targeting civilians, that kind of an eye-for-an-eye eye mentality. And alongside Hezbollah's stated commitment to escalating their attacks against Israel, if Israel escalates their assaults on the Gaza Strip, which, by the way, they're almost certain to do. They've said they're going to continue to do that. Well, then you've got the recipe for an expanding region-wide war. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. It's been one month since the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel. More than 240 hostages are still held captive by the terrorist group. Israeli troops have surrounded Gaza City and are fighting house to house. World leaders are increasing the pressure on Israel to declare a ceasefire. Prime Minister Netanyahu says that will only benefit Hamas and also hamper the efforts to free the hostages. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has the latest from Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told ABC News Israel isn't ready for a ceasefire. Well, there'll be no uh ceasefire, general ceasefire in Gaza without the release of our hostages. As far as tactical little pauses, an hour here, an hour there, we've had them before. I suppose uh, we'll check the circumstances in order to enable uh, goods, humanitarian goods to come in or our hostages, uh, individual hostages to leave. But I don't think there's going to be a general ceasefire. Netanyahu believes a ceasefire would hamper the war against Hamas and the effort to get the hostages. He also told 80 ambassadors what he believes is at stake in this war. What we see is a broader battle between civilization and barbarism. The barbarism is led by an axis of terror. The axis of terror is led by Iran. And we believe that all civilized powers should back us in this effort because this battle is your battle and our victory is your victory. Israel's military says it's cut off Gaza City and separated Hamas strongholds in the north and south. The fighting is now house-to-house -house and close-quarter combat. The IDF also uncovered evidence of Hamas hiding rocket launches inside a mosque and even this boys' club. An IDF officer showed the pictures on the wall 
while at the end of the room are rocket launchers aimed at the Israeli city of Ashkelon and other cities to the north. Israel has long charged Hamas with using hospitals, schools and mosques as cover for its military operations and says it constitutes a pattern of war crimes. The IDF also released this footage of Gazans fleeing the combat zone when they opened up a civilian corridor. And this video reportedly shows Gazans leaving the conflict zone under a white flag secured by Israeli tanks. Back in Washington, in a leaked memo, Politico reported some mid-level diplomats at the State Department are criticizing the White House for being too supportive of Israel and calling for a ceasefire. But at the White House, National Security Spokesman John Kirby reminded the world why Israel is fighting this war. I think it, it doesn't hurt for us here in the first week of November to remember what happened in the first week of October and what that felt like and what that looked like and, and the, the, the grotesque stories that, that were coming out uh, of Israel uh, from on, the, on the 7th and the 8th and the 9th of October uh, last month uh, and what they're up against, the kind of enemy they're up against. What are they going to do if they're surrounded? What are they going to do if 150,000 advanced missiles are going to be shot? What are they going to do if Iran gets involved? Well, they can't win a conventional war. What are they going to do? I think I know what they'd do. I know what we would do. We would destroy the enemy because otherwise we're exterminated. You're the prime minister of Israel. You're about to send hundreds of thousands of your troops in to take out the enemy once and for all. And I'm saying to you this, I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes it's tough. If Israel is going to face annihilation, you think they have those nukes in there to collect dust? I'm not even encouraging anything be done. I'm not even saying nuke them, nuke them, nuke them. I am saying Iran needs to understand and Hezbollah needs to understand that if you think you're gonna wipe out these people, you're not. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.